in, in this first session, uh, what I would like to do is look at the work of the Spirit in regeneration and the importance of that for understanding both faith and the task of theology. Now, um, the question, what is saving faith, has been a um, slightly more um, hotter issue recently, particularly to do with John Piper's book, um, What is Saving Faith? So it's possible that issues around that may come up. But that's not really, we, we, we might well touch on that, um, but that's not really what I want to address this morning. I want to really see um, the significance of the Spirit's regeneration for the task of being a theologian. Because theology is faith-seeking understanding. And faith is the fruit of a regenerated heart. And therefore, the work of the Spirit in regeneration is vital for theology. And yet, I think, it's a topic that is too often neglected, forgotten in the task of theology. So I want us to have a little look at the work of the Spirit in regeneration and, and try to just tease out what this means for us in terms of being theologians. So let me start with um, a little brief historical theology. Uh, the early church fathers, um, a number of them taught on regeneration, Augustine particularly at length taught on regeneration. But the place I want to dive into particularly is the Reformation, because the importance of regeneration was especially highlighted during the Reformation. Um, so this isn't to make any statement about lack of teaching on regeneration earlier. That simply wouldn't be the case. But it, its importance is highlighted in the Reformation. So that's why I'm zeroing in there. Um, and in many ways, the Reformation as a whole would be a fight for that line in the creed, we believe in the Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Because wrapped up in that affirmation, is the belief we do not have life in ourselves. We therefore need, and here was the challenge for the medieval Roman Catholicism of the day, we therefore need more than an enabling grace. We need life. As the Spirit hovered over the waters in the beginning, giving life to creation, so we need uh, the Spirit in order to have new life. And so Luther wrote, the first thing that belief in the Spirit means is, by my own, I quote, by my own reason or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel. So in other words, Luther's saying that because of the work of the Spirit in regeneration, salvation cannot be a cooperative effort. God merely assisting or enabling weak sinners. Uh, sa salvation is a divine rescue, God raising the dead. Belief in the Spirit as the giver of life, Luther saw means salvation by grace alone. For Luther said elsewhere, he said, we never read the Holy Spirit was given to anybody because he'd performed some works, but always when men had heard the gospel of Christ and the mercy of God. And what that meant was the reformers believed in a radical from the inside out change. Very briefly, some context might be, you may well be aware that the medieval Roman Catholic understanding of grace that Luther was working with until then was that grace is a thing given, uh, it's a created thing given to enable us to do better. And Luther 
saw in the period 1515 to 1519 that our sinfulness is such that we need more than behavior modification. We need a deep internal reformation through the spirit so that our hearts are overturned, so that love for self is eclipsed by love for the Lord. So Luther's starting to see a difference in the need to be born again, in God-haters being won by the gospel, not just to an outward act of obedience to God, but to a desire for, a delight in, a love for God. And the early, um, the early English uh, Bible translator, William Tyndale, he was one of the um, earliest reformers to make clear how this belief in the living spirit, uh, how, how this makes a difference to the ritualism he'd grown up with. He explained it like this. Tyndale said, our problem is the heart with all the powers, affections, and appetites wherewith we can but sin. The solution is the spirit which looseth the heart. So the spirit is the only one who has the ability to loose our hearts from the enslaving love of sin and win them to the freedom of knowing God. And he says, unless the believer had felt the infinite mercy, goodness, love, and kindness of God, and a fellowship of the blood of Christ, and the comfort of the Spirit of Christ in his heart, he could never have forsaken anything for God's sake. And in, so in a track that he smuggled into England alongside um, copies of his New Testament translation, he wrote this. Um, so this is to fellow, fellow Englishmen that he sees trapped in ritualism. And he writes this, If thou wilt be at peace with God and love him, thou must turn to the promises of God and to the gospel, which is called of Paul in the place before rehearsed to the Corinthians, the ministration of righteousness and of the Spirit. For faith bringeth pardon and forgiveness freely purchased by Christ's blood. Now listen to this. And bringeth also the Spirit, the Spirit looseth the bonds of the devil and setteth us at liberty. Now that theology made for the most practical difference in Reformation circles because the reformers saw the root of our problem doesn't lie in our behavior, but beneath our behavior, uh, that our outward acts of sin are manifestations of that deeper heart problem. And so merely to alter a person's behavior without dealing with those heart desires is just gonna cultivate hypocrisy, a cloak for a vicious heart. Now, this all seems pretty familiar, I, I would guess, um, to us today, but it's easy to miss how revolutionary it was, um, this theology of the spirit, because in Luther's day, medieval Roman Catholicism had become, in many ways, for many, uh, not all, um, but for many, quite an impersonal system of salvation. And so grace was a thing given to enable sinners to acquire holiness for the sake of heaven. And that meant that as a young man, Luther never dreamed of actually enjoying direct communion with God. So think of that famous moment where the thunderstorm knocks him um, to the ground, and he screams out, St. Anne, help me, because he'd never prayed directly to God in his life, ever. And it would be another few years before he first prayed to God, because the liturgy commanded him to. And 
what Luther came to see very early in the Reformation was that in God giving us his spirit, that theology had to change. So he wrote this. He said, besides giving and entrusting to us everything in heaven and on earth, God has given us his Son and his Holy Spirit in order to bring us to himself. Now, you could have maybe trotted out that line quite easily, but that was a radical line, to bring us not to heaven or holiness, but to bring us to himself. So he's giving us his Son and his Holy Spirit to bring us to himself. In other words, more than any gift or thing, by the Spirit, God is giving us himself to know, to enjoy. So God is the reward of the gospel. Knowing him is the life for which we're saved. So a couple of things that just we're already noticing with this theology of the Spirit. Instead of superficial behavioral change, this theology of the Spirit means deep heart metamorphosis. Instead of blessings from God, this is primarily the blessing, the treasure is personal communion with God. And these are some of the vital benefits of the reformer's theology of the Spirit. Now, let me move on from the Reformation to evangelicalism post-Reformation. Now, evangelicalism um, has been a, uh, a tradition of the book. And so evangelicals have been, uh, in many ways, quite propositional as Christians. But evangelicalism has always been about more than a list of doctrines, uh, more than bare or dead orthodoxy. Evangelicals want theological truths of the gospel to transform us by the renewing of our minds. And so Jim Packer described evangelicalism like this in a beautifully succinct way. He said, evangelicalism is an ethos of convertedness within a larger ethos of Catholicity. Shall I just say that again? Evangelicalism, he said, is an ethos of convertedness within a larger ethos of Catholicity. And so the evangelical doesn't simply want to know truths about God. The evangelical wants to know God. Not simply affirm that scripture is our supreme authority, but submit to scripture. Enjoy Christ as our savior. Now that feature of evangelicalism has commonly been referred to following David Bebbington as conversionism. Uh, I assume you're aware of the Bebbington quadrilateral, uh, what are often called the four marks of evangelicalism. I think this usually misunderstood. What Bebbington's trying to do is show the four family resemblances that show the historical continuities of this tradition. That's what he's trying to do. But what it, uh, those four marks have often been taken to mean is these are the four basic theological concerns of evangelicalism, and then it sounds a bit odd. Um, but so conversionism, Bebbington is right, uh, that is a uh, family resemblance, a family DNA marker of evangelicalism. The story of evangelicalism is littered with story after story of conversion. But conversionism isn't really the evangelical principle itself. It, it's the historical evidence of the principle. Underneath conversionism is the real evangelical principle, the need for the Spirit's regeneration. 
And that's important to make that distinction for reasons we might, we might get on to. So with the Reformation and evangelicalism, there's this turn to theology of the spirit, the importance of the spirit's work of regeneration. John Calvin's been called in many ways the theologian of the Holy Spirit. When he comes to the Christian life, having looked at the work of the Father and the work of the Son, the third book of his institutes is all about the work of the Spirit. That's really where rubber hits the road in the institutes. But that said, all that history taken on board, Martin Lloyd-Jones said in the late 1960s that there'd been a turn away from that tradition within evangelicalism. And he said it like this um, in a lecture he gave in 1967. He said, if I understand the condition of the church today, and indeed during the last 50 years or so, I would say that its great trouble has been that it has fallen into this particular error. And the error he's looking at really is, um, he was looking at under its historical label, Sandemanianism, which I'll come to in just a moment. But what he's really talking about is a neglect of the need for the spirit to regenerate our hearts. So let me talk about Sandemanianism, how Lloyd-Jones saw Sandemanianism infecting evangelicalism, and how this is about a neglect of the need for the Spirit's regenerative work. Let me just pause there so far. Everyone with me? This all, all okay? Yeah? Okay. Uh, do, do just interrupt if, you, if you've got a question. We'll, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A in a bit, but if there's something that I just need to clarify, please, please say as I go. Sandemanianism, it, it was named for its leading champion, the Scottish pastor Robert Sandeman. Um, his dates were 1718 to 1771, if you want. So he's an 18th century guy. And being an 18th century guy, it shouldn't surprise you to learn that Sandemanianism was a rationalistic sect. And really towards the end of the 18th century, early 19th century, that's its heyday. And the Sandemanianism, the Sandemanians were known for their view that saving faith is, I quote, this is how they defined it, is bare belief of the bare truth. And Sandeman's argument, um, it, it was a very evangelical argument. Uh, he argued, if faith involves anything more than bare assent to the truth of the gospel, then you are making faith a meritorious work. So Luther had talked about passive faith, and Sandeman's really arguing for that. He's wanting to protect the absolute freeness of God's salvation and therefore deny that saving faith involves any active leaning of the heart upon God, any activity. Faith must be passive or else it is a work. And so faith, he judged, must therefore be nothing more the, than the intellectual acknowledgement that the gospel is true. So it cannot involve active trust in, or to use the Piper language of the book that we might come on to, treasuring of Christ. So faith, Sandeman concluded, must involve nothing more than the mind's assent that the gospel is true. It's acknowledgement, not trust. And in this, the, the Sandemanians were seeking to be orthodox, assiduous students of scripture with the deepest commitment to biblical exposition, preaching. But 
because it's bare acknowledgement without any understanding of the sickness of the heart or the need for the Spirit's work in the heart. Uh, let me read you the experience of um, one Welsh preacher who joined the Sandemanians for a while. His name was Christmas Evans. Um, he said that in that period, um, as a Sandemanian, he fell into the grip of a cold heart towards Christ and his sacrifice and the work of his spirit, a cold heart in the pulpit, in secret prayer and in the study. It left me in the cold and sterile regions of spiritual frost. Now, Sanderman's teaching um, managed to get a number of followers, but it did concern many more. And the man who led the criticism of um, Sandemanians um, was Andrew Fuller, uh, who was just a few years younger than Sanderman. And he responded to Sandemanianism with his, probably his magnum opus, Strictures on Sandemanianism, uh, 12 Letters to a Friend. And here's the heart of Fuller's argument. He argued Sandemanianism failed to see that faith is a fruit of regeneration. That might be theologically the most key moment there. Faith is a fruit of regeneration. In other words, Fuller saw, only the person whose heart has been renewed by the Spirit will ever come to a true saving faith. So faith cannot be a mere act of the mind independent of the heart. Because if it was, how would true faith be different from nominal faith? The nominal Christian can mentally assent to the truths of the gospel, but that sort of belief is no different to the faith of the demons who, James 2, believe and shudder. So saving faith in the New Testament is an act of the heart as much as an act of the mind. So Paul wrote to the Romans, Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And this was something Lloyd-Jones picked up on in his lecture on Sandemanianism, um, saying that Sanderman needed to argue that heart in scripture meant exactly the same thing as mind, and argued at some length that that is not how scripture speaks, that scripture does make a distinction between the two. Uh, there is overlap, but there is distinction. And so that saving faith is inextricably related to the heart and its affections. It's more than intellectual assent. Um, he, he's building here on, for example, the work of the Puritan theologian William Ames, who said, saving faith is a resting of the heart on God. Think of how faith is spoken of in John's Gospel. Uh, in John's Gospel, John 1, those who believed in his name are equated with those who also did receive him. That John 1, 12. Uh, John 6, 35, those who believe in him are equated with those who come to him. But sinners who are naturally hostile to God aren't going to come to him unless their affections are turned so they want to come to him. So some change is necessary for them to want to come. But if Sanderman was right, the opposite of saving faith would be mere ignorance. But in scripture, the reason people do not believe in Jesus is not simply ignorance. The reason for their unbelief is what they love. John 3, they love the darkness rather than the light. Uh, Romans 8, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. 
um, 2 Thessalonians 2, therefore the wicked refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Uh, Jesus tells the unbelieving Jews in his day, the reason they don't believe in him is because they do not love him. Uh, the author of the Hebrews, take care, brothers, lest any among you have an evil, unbelieving heart. Hebrews 3. So both faith and unbelief involve more, not less than, but more than knowledge and the mind. Unbelief flows from a hostility of heart that is averse to the truth. Faith flows from a heart that has been turned to love Christ and embraces truth. And so we who believe don't simply know things about Christ. We've come to him because we desire him. And the result of the Sandemanians' mistake was a heartless faith. It was very sure of its own orthodoxy, but it was, well, it, it, was, it was legalistic and ultimately idolatrous. Um, Andrew Fuller said, the love of God as God is not in it. He said, conversion is not turning to the Lord. It professes to love God, but for its own sake. And what he's getting at there is that the Sandemanians were really treasuring the benefits of salvation rather than the Savior. And not appreciating the love of God, because it's simply assenting to truth about God, what happened practically is Sandemanianism fell into an emphasis on outward performance. It's neglecting... Uh, the heart. And as soon as they did that, that emphasis on outward particulars, it, it went to a cult-like favoring of shibboleths, of here are the particular things to do or say, because the outward assumed that level of importance. And so it became increasingly a closed sect. Um, close to all those who weren't of their exact custom. And it told in Sandemanian preaching. Now, interestingly, the Sandemanians were known as um, those in their day who were some of the most avidly committed to biblical exposition. But it wasn't the lack of preaching that was a problem it was what they were seeking to do in preaching. That in preaching, because the basic human problem they're seeing is ignorance, the solution is merely education. And therefore, preaching became purely educative, informing the mind, overcoming ignorance, not affecting or attempting to be transformative because ignorance is what they're trying to address. And so you had uh, lecturing instead of preaching, uh, mechanical um, prayer meetings, um, praying, preaching by numbers, um, joyless, delightless, uh, because the heart and its depravity were ignored. And he who's forgiven little loves little. And I think Lloyd-Jones is correct that such Sandemanian symptoms and therefore Sandemanian neglect of the heart still exist with us today. And I think that is ramped up in theological circles. And, and I see this particularly in looking after a seminary or theological college. This is a prime concern for me in teaching theology to particularly young men. And so I've got a couple of 
things I just want to comment on at the end before we open this up to discussion. Um, what is saving faith? I've, um, I've, I've touched on that really already. I think I, I don't want to right now address um, the John Piper book issue, but we can come to that if we want to in the discussion. But, but saving faith, we, if we're to be faithful to scripture, we need to see it as more than mere mental assent to truth. There is a coming to Christ, a receiving of him, a trust in him. But what about regeneration and the task of theology? What I think we're seeing so far, so that's a bit of historical setup, to see that doxology is not merely the devotional icing that decorates theology. I think it's very easy for theologians to think, yes, theology should lead to doxology, but doxology, worship, is a detachable sugary addition. We can do the proper work of theology. It would be nice if it leads to worship, but that actually could be snipped out and we can still be doing good theology. And I think what we've seen so far about the Spirit's work of regeneration is that simply can't be the case. That actually doxology is not simply the goal of theology, it fuels healthy theology. Because if theology is faith-seeking understanding, and faith is the fruit of a regenerated heart, then you can't be doing healthy theology unless it comes from a place of doxology. And that's got to be a challenge for us practically as we do theology ourselves. And that's a profound concern for me as I teach a young generation of um, younger, uh, some wanted to be theologians, some wanted to be pastors. Um, I, th I think a biblical verse that springs to mind uh, in relation to this would be Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We usually go for the, the Proverbs 9 one, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which itself is a, a challenge to us because when we look for wisdom in making appointments, for instance, and in looking for uh, helpful advice from people, it's often IQ we, we look to for wisdom, not fear of the Lord. Um, which, for those of us who've been in academic meetings, we should have overcome that because you should realize you can have people with extremely high IQs who can make extremely foolish decisions. High IQ does not equal wisdom. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Any knowledge of God that is devoid of such fearful, worshipful, wondering at God is actually blind knowledge, barren knowledge, because the living God is not truly known where he's not truly worshipped, adored. And the way for me this, uh, this rolls out in teaching uh, younger students is how our theological studies so easily become exercises in puffing ourselves up. You think of um, you know, Helmut Thielicke's little book, book, A Little Exercise for Young Theologians, where, do you remember it, where he's, he says there's a stage people go through when they've done a year or two of theology, which he calls theological puberty, um, in which the young, it's usually young man, infatuated with new theological concepts, is filled with this Gnostic pride, and his love dies in the devilish thrill of acquiring a knowledge that means power. And his skewed knowledge makes him into a graceless theological thug. Um, he's always itching for a chance to show off his powers. He's not shaped and driven by doxology. I talk about, so that, that, that young stage, 
I talk to my students about um, that wonderful word being sophomore, being a wise fool, that after doing a year of study, you can think you're sophisticated and wise and actually be a moron. And, and it's hardly as if the older theologians are exempt from this. I see theologians publishing who do not seem immune to this disease are publishing out of a desire to show off their prowess rather than shaped deeply by doxology, love for Christ, love for his church and people. But there is no true knowledge of God where there's no right fear of him. And that is really the takeaway challenge that I wanted to bring for us, that in our work of theology, we need to remember how faith is the fruit of a regenerated heart, and therefore our work of theology must not just lead to, but flow from doxology. Otherwise, the theology we do simply cannot be healthy, evangelical theology. And it can become, like the graceless young thug, profoundly dangerous. And the brighter and more able you are, the more dangerous it can be.